Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does PSYOPs fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that, first and foremost, PSYOPs save lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOPs. They think it's something deviant and brainwashing. you don't know exactly what's going on right now, but we do know that there are some psyops going on, right? Ma'am, I don't know. Cinema psyops. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels. I know what it does to you. Cinema psyops. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. Hello! And welcome to the 265th consecutive week of Cinema PsyOps. Sure, sometimes I put stuff out on a holiday Monday instead of the Sunday that I normally would because I don't have to work that day and that's just how I feel about it. But I'm your host, Court. I'm the one who runs Barter Town. I'm the guy who gets to make the decision. Having no say in anything at all other than basically what he writes for his reviews is Matt. So it's kind of like a capitalist society we say it's labor day but we still do work (laughs) this is our hobby this is supposed to be our fun i know i was fucking around it's fun time i've been holding on that joke for a while (laughs) it's only work in that when we cover danzig movies we have to work to try and make a show happen yeah that's that that's when you have to make some sacrifices one of the bonuses of covering veronica the week before it makes every movie that we cover thereafter seem so much better this this movie this week seemed like damn near citizen kane comparatively (laughs) it had actual acting and editing and special effects that made sense it's fucking ridiculous i feel so spoiled by class of 1999 this week what have we done to deserve such a thing? <laughs> My goodness, our entertainment is actually trying to make a cohesive plot. It's actually trying to entertain me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Holy have fuck. you seen Class of 1999 before doing it for the show? Have you ever seen that before? Fuck. It, it, the more I saw it, the more I thought I'd seen it a couple times. But I'm not sure. Okay, so you think you may have seen it, but you're not sure you didn't. Nothing really was yeah. like sticking out. The reason I ask is this was a cable staple. This was on cable a shitload. Yeah, it, that's one reason why I think I may have seen it. But there's also one other thing is that it stars a lot of people who are that guy. So then I don't know if it's just because I've seen something else with those guys in it. Yeah, I could totally see that where there's faces that you recognize from other things. So you think you may have seen this. Uh, This was definitely one that I have seen a shit ton before buying when it finally came out on Blu-ray, the Blu-ray of it. This was one of those movies that I caught on cable at a very, very young age and just watched the hell out of it pretty frequently. 
Um, it's kind of your typical mindless sci-fi action movie of this era. This is very early, like 1990 when this was made. So they're trying to predict the future of nine years out of all this technology that's about to happen. And in the 90s, I can see where people would think that perhaps all of this technology would come about by the end of the 90s because there was still hope well, in the world. And also the well, also everyone thought school kids would become so mass violent that they take over the country. <laughs> Had you seen Class of 1984, which is essentially this movie's uh, predecessor? It's not necessarily a sequel. This is more like a uh, remake, Will, where they wanted to go back to the well. The same guy who uh, did Class of 1984 did Class of 1999. No, I've, I've never seen that. Okay. Pretty basic story of uh, our inner city schools going amok and kids taking over and, you know, one teacher tries to stand up against the rising tide of these evil fucking students that are destroying the school and the world around them with dealing drugs and all of that kind of stuff. And the gangs go after him and it kind of turns into sort of a rape revenge kind of movie too all at once. Uh, it's kind of similar around the same vein of like the principal with John Belushi. I don't know if you remember that movie or not where yes. they had to clean up the school and the school. Yeah, that one I remember. Yeah, well, like picture a more sleazy version of that even and that's what Class of 1984 was. And I'm not saying that as a disparaging thing. I think it's fucking brilliant. I love Class of 1984. I think it's a great fucking movie. And this was them going back to that well and trying to make a sequel to that. But, you know, it was already 1990 by the time they were getting ready yeah. to do that. Did we do the principle? We've never covered the principle, but you and I have talked about the principle before. Okay. <laughs> not even about those, like not even on this show. That was just kind of something that we've talked about yeah. movie wise. <laughs> I think it came up because we were having an argument on whether or not James Ballou she should have been a dramatic actor versus a comedic actor because his timing for dramatic work is much better than it is for comedy. Yeah, yeah, we were we were discussing that because I agreed with that. I did. Yeah, he's a much better dramatic actor than comedy actor. Yeah, I think he kind of got pigeonholed into it because of John's death. I think that's why Jim yeah. Belushi got pigeonholed into doing comedy. And there's some stuff that he's done that is pretty funny, but he's better at being a straight man. He's, you know, like he's better at just playing it straight and having the comedy bounce off of him by people overreacting to things. Like, yeah. Like real man and John Ritter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Exactly. Jim Belushi's best work in Real Men is basically him trying to play everything down and saying that everything's not a big deal and don't be shocked while John Ritter melts the fuck down constantly for the whole movie. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, it's this is true. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, we just covered a whole bunch of Jim Belushi movies and uh, we've We're had done. our Jim Belushi uh, appreciation hour. Have a happy Labor Day, everyone. Let's, uh, let's go to bed. <laughs> no, we need to talk about Class of 1999 because I am excited to talk about this movie. Now, there was a direct sequel to Class of 1999, which was, I believe, Class of 1999 to The Substitute. Um, that film is moderately okay. <laughs> it's moderately. That film is, I guess, it's fine as well. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. But that film didn't have what this film does. Yeah. Which is... <laughs> Ed from Northern Exposure as a punker. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, is Ed from Northern Exposure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really isn't. I'm just fucking around. Oh, right. fuck, it look like him. Yeah, we're going to take a little break here. We're going to play some music that's aggressively cyberpunk and industrial and all the kinds of stuff that fits in with this class of 1999 flick. Well, when you come back, we will have the trailer. This is Bo from LegionPodcasts.com. Hey, it's been a crazy time. And when the world gets nuts, we're happy to offer some old fashioned podcast entertainment. But for some folks, getting a laugh out of a show isn't really helping these days. People who depend on tips in their bartending jobs or have been put on furlough with no pay till the worst of this coronavirus threat has passed. That's a tough spot. That's why we set up a GoFundMe for members of our community, a sort of grand scale take a penny, leave a penny. For people like myself, for whom the recent disruptions haven't kicked us out of work, well, we can drop a few of those extra pennies in the GoFundMe jar for those who are directly affected by recent events and find themselves looking for money to pay the electric bill or keep the water on, well, how about you give me a shout at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Let me know the situation and what you need, and we'll do our best to make life a little easier. And you can find links to the GoFundMe on the front page of legionpodcasts.com on our Facebook group page or on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, where it's the pinned tweet. For those of you who are able, thanks in advance for chipping in. And members of our community who need a hand, hey, here we are. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all going to get through this together. Legion isn't just a name, it's who we are. 
Thanks for listening to all the shows here on Legion Podcasts, and we'll talk to you soon. So I did just double check and holy fuck, it really is it from Northern Exposure. Are you fucking me? <laughs> no, I'm not fucking with you right now. So in 1990, the actor Darren E. Burroughs, known very prominently to every kid in the 90s as Ed from Northern Exposure, he was in Class of 1999 as Sonny, which is who we thought he was. Well, that's him. But he was also in Cry Baby all in the same year when Northern Exposure got started. Huh, how about that? <laughs> so there you go. Fucking Ed from Northern Exposure's in this movie, and that makes me love Class of 1999 even more. <laughs> and now the trailer's going to ruin it for everyone. Of course. In 1998, six million violent incidents took place in American yes, high schools. <laughs> including 29,927 teacher fatalities. The public school system has been reduced to a battlefield. But the Board of Education has just found a solution. Tommy! The perfect solution. You're next, Mr. Cope. For the class of 1999. What are you? The class of 1999. We're supposed to educate the students. Battle droids, Miles. Battle droids. To graduate is to survive. Okay, graduate is to survive, Matt. Uh, take us through class of 1999. Well, the, it already did that. We're done. No, um, all right. So we open up with kind of a, uh, well, kind of a, a description of the current happenings. And actually, we're going to open up with a clip. In 1992, there were 543,767 violent incidents in American high schools. In some cities, the areas around these schools were beginning to fall under the control of violent youth gangs. By 1997, the number of violent incidents had tripled. Gangs had taken control of large sections of these cities. Some schools were shut down. The year is 1999. The gang-controlled areas have become known as Free Fire Zones. Kennedy High is located in the middle of a Free Fire Zone. The police will not enter. There is no law. The Department of Education of Defense has been formed to reopen the schools and control the gangs. That vocoder voice makes you know that it is the future. Yes. We are now in the future. These are the future times of 1999. So, <laughs> this um, is an alternative future for everyone. And much like a RoboCop type of introduction in a business room, three cyborg teachers are now introduced to um, a, a litany of, I, would, I guess, what a principal and then other, I guess, school officials. Uh, all during this time, while they're being uh, introduced, we see a kid getting out of jail, being released. Uh, so, you know, it's probably going to have some good times coming up. Um, <laughs> the kid's brother and his wastoid friend pick him up and... Uh, it, it seems like they want him to kind of just rejoin gang life, and he's actually seemingly not really wanting to get back into this lifestyle. Did you recognize the sort of whiny-voiced little brother that was driving the car? I've seen him a shit ton, too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you don't know what from, though? Shit. Not really. I mean, I couldn't tell you definitively. Okay, so most of our audience would probably know him as Homer from Near Dark. A good significant amount of them will recognize him as Tim from River's Edge. 
some of the more real hardcore watched a lot of HBO when they were way too young kids like myself will recognize him as the annoying little piece of shit brother from Teen Witch. Teen Witch. Yeah. <laughs> he was, uh, I think his Richie was his name in Teen Witch. He was a fucking real piece of shit. But most people are going to recognize him that have seen Near Dark. They're going to recognize him as Homer. He was the little kid vampire Homer in Near Dark. Uh, he was like the annoying shit. He plays, he's really good at playing the annoying shit, but he's the annoying shit Tim in River's Edge. And uh, Teen Witch is the one that mostly everybody's going to recognize him from. But he's been in a ton of stuff, a ton of TV and all of that. He basically, being a short-statured uh, guy that looked super young almost his entire life, ended up playing a lot of kid roles like this for an extended period of time, like over a decade. Yeah, because he, yeah, he looks pretty young, so... That's like him and Kristen DeBell that we were talking about with Cheerleaders Wild Weekend, where she played 16-year-olds for like 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, as they're driving home, they actually roll through some enemy gang territory. Uh, he talks shit to one of the, like, the leader, Hector, the leader of that uh, gang. And uh, they chase him, and he's able to, like, get away from him in the car chase. And, uh, you know, so you already get an idea that he's kind of not very well liked by other gangs, but fuck them. It's also a good world building thing, too, because you see these various cars that have been modified into battle tanks that were, like, old sedans or old. Uh, station wagon cars that the gang that they drive through and then their fancy ass fucking futuristic Cadillac kind of car where it looks like it was a Cadillac that they did minimum modifications to where they like drop the headlights down and out a little bit to try and make it look more futuristic <laughs> they, yeah. like, they cut the bumper and moved it up to where the lights should be it's just weird shit like that uh, that just makes no sense as to why anybody would do that to a car even in the future and then uh, you kind of get maybe also a feeling that this kid went to prison prison doing something with this Hector kid because he's like you know he, he was like, uh, you should have tried it. You know, when the Hector was like, hey, how was prison? And he goes, it wasn't bad. You should probably should have tried it. It almost seems like, you know, he's like, you you piece of shit. <laughs> I thought it was more like because they were trying to harass him about how much he would have enjoyed prison. And he uh, was making a sort of uh, offhanded toxic male gay joke at the guy where he should try it because he'll enjoy it more. Because he then, then he made a kissy face at him right after he said that. That that could be also as well. So I, I was picking up something else different. Well, yeah, there's. <laughs> There's certainly animosity amongst the gangs, but the movie yeah. doesn't really bother to set up too much backstory on that but beyond the fact that it's all gangs vying for territory. Like, you just have to push the I believe button that there yes. is this long built up animosity between all these gangs for something more than territory. And apparently Seattle just hasn't been gentrified yet. <laughs> oh, the coffee will change it all. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. All you got to get is those upper middle class white folk in there and th they'll take care of it. Uh <laughs> yeah, because when they call the cops, the cops come running to protect them. Goddamn right. And they'll blow anybody away. And they definitely know how to suck the culture out of anything. <laughs> um, Starbucks gentrifying since 93. Right. All right. So um, then uh, the new teachers are starting now at Kennedy High. We see them going in. Everyone's kind of getting set. Um, as Cody, his brother, and his wastoid friend get to school, he gets taken in by security. The friend does. Uh, they want to search his car. Those are all and brothers, by the way. They're all brothers. Are they all brothers? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know. I thought that was just a friend. Okay. So his, his older brother, I guess, then. Yep. Um, so uh, the little brother wants to fight, but Cody drives him away and tells him to you know hey you know just forget about him you know it's uh, you know you'll be happier you did and then his gang members uh that cody was a member of are start asking him if you know hey what are you doing it's like you're not trying to be in the gang anymore and that's when cody much pretty much tells him they're like you know maybe we should kill you and cody goes well if I hang out in the game anymore, I won't, I'll do actual serious time or you'll kill me. But either way, I'm dead. So you, you kind of get the idea that the actual prison system there is probably a lot like our prison system <laughs> in which it, you're not going to live through it. Yeah, it's not designed for that. It's designed to burn you up and use you up as fuel for its fucking slave labor. Yes, exactly. So um, in the first class, the Pam Gear robot, she's teaching some chemistry and she beats the shit out of some gang members who won't listen to her. 
See, um, I thought she was just doing one of those, like, uh, what was that Michelle Pfeiffer movie where she's, like, teaching inner city youth? What was oh, this? yeah. Dangerous Minds. Yeah. She was doing some Dangerous Minds shit where she was trying to show them that she means business, but she wants to expand their consciousness, not knock them unconscious. Yeah, no, no she wants to knock them unconscious. And, and, I and know. I'm just being facetious. It's very clearly her abusing students because she can get away with it. Yeah. And because it's Pam Greer, it's fucking hot, and I'm just going to let it be. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably be all right with it, too. I mean, it's it's Pam Greer, so, I mean. <laughs> Use all the students you want, Pam Greer. They're, they mean nothing. <laughs> nothing, I said. <laughs> as long as you're happy, Pam, we're happy. Um. So then, uh, the uh, a girl sitting right next to Cody is starting to, like, flirt with him, starting to hit on him, and she's kind of like a uh, one of the few, I guess you would say, preppy kids in this whole entire fucking building did you recognize that actress from anything no okay that is tracy lind is her name um most folks i think would recognize her from maybe the road to wellville she was in she was the nurse she was uh, matthew broderick's nurse uh in road to wellville she was in my boyfriend's back which was a 90s movie where she was like um the love interest in that obviously this film class of 1999 there was a 90s version of handmaiden's tale and i believe she she was the off Warren, uh, June, Janine, whatever character you want to call her. She was also in Fright Night 2. She was Charlie's second girlfriend in Fright Night 2, the one that was a speed reader and actually ended up saving the day and being the badass. Oh, nice. Yeah. So she's been in a ton of different stuff, like TV and things like that. Um, I think she was in Werewolf, the TV series, if I remember correctly, because I fucking love that show as well. So I'm not just going to go through and name off a bunch of different stuff, but like she's been in a bunch of things that you would probably recognize her from, as well as had a few like background actors actress roles where like you know there's supporting character roles that you've seen her in the background of other movies and stuff too yeah um well anyway she's sitting on cody and uh through the grapevine cody tends to find out that she is actually the prin- the new principal's daughter uh, yeah the principal of course being malcolm mcdowell there so which oddly enough i think their facial structures match enough to where you can believe that malcolm mcdowell had her as his daughter right so um then we cut to the next class is the old guy and uh, the old guy robot and he's teaching history. Two schizoids can't fucking stop so he ends up fucking spanking them. <laughs> Literally, right. he spanks them. Yeah, they're both leaders of the gangs. I don't know if you noticed that or they're members of the opposite gangs and they're fighting because they are members of the opposite gangs and then oh, yeah. because he goes after each of the prominent members like that and embarrasses them in such a way the gangs decide they can't let that go. They need to get vengeance on that so there you go they're all fucking uh, they're getting spanked and that's weird and that kind of concludes the first 20 minutes of the movie there's some people monitoring what these uh, cybernetic or just full on yeah. cyborg beings I don't even know if they got yeah there's parts. some scientists in the schools yeah and they're monitoring them and they're kind of just basically letting the machines run their programs as they're designed and seeing how they react to this stuff and then they move forward and like decide on whether or not they're going to do anything. Stacy Keach's character has the power of his fucking rat tail that will not be denied. We got we got to talk and, about the solid and, 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 white and hair. whited out eyes too. Yeah. By the way, yeah, he looks like an albino freak from hell with a black mustache. This is the most eighties looking awesome Stacy Keach look I could possibly have ever hoped for. This that, is the dramatic end result of what should have happened from the hair segment in Body Bags that he was in. That that rat tail really it it caused some. It was like, holy shit. <laughs> it's like the makers of this film saw Brian Bosworth and went, we need to get that hairstyle on Stacey Keach. That is something else right there. <laughs> right? Because it's That's... the same fucking like sort of mullet that gets cut into a point that makes it this mullet rat tail, this mullet tail thing. That's sort of like, that's that's power right there. That's real shit. <laughs> <laughs> Have you not seen Stone Cold? God damn, Brian Bosworth's awesome. In that. <laughs> Fuck, give this guy a rat tail. Fucking now. <laughs> Make him look as much like Sting in 1985 as you possibly can. And I mean the pro wrestler. The pro no, no, wrestler. Not, not, not the makeup, just the hair. S- yeah, no, no, no makeup, just the hair. Just the hair. <laughs> Just, <laughs> yeah. I want people to think that apparently we, uh, that uh, this is a surfer who just kind of let himself go. <laughs> <laughs> but 
basically. All right. So the first 20 minutes of the movie, just to kind of bring it back to actual reality here, now that we've done bagging on that rat tail, right? Um, so the first 20 minutes of this movie, I think, does an excellent job of setting up the world building. You see how bad the prison system is. You see that a fucking kid who's still in high school is being tried and put in prison as an adult in yeah. this world. And then you're also seeing that because they're opening the school back, and this school is in a demilitarized, depoliced zone, which makes it very pertinent to talk about nowadays because this is the thing that they're all trying to warn you about in the conservative media side of things where they're trying to terrify you of what a possible Joe Biden America would look like. But that's, that's actually what Trump America is. Currently, right. So that's what they're trying to like. If you want four more years of this, vote for Biden. I don't know how that works, but okay, whatever. I, I don't either. You know, the whole demilitarized thing that they're trying to portray in this movie is what the conservatives have been trying to make people be afraid of when they've been pushing that law and order agenda. Actually, anybody who pushes a law and order agenda, this is the bullshit image that they're trying to get you to believe. And this world building sets this up and gives you this sense of just sheer, utter hopelessness. And it really reminded me of the opening of Death Wish 3, which is why I think I gravitate towards this movie more so than I normally would, because this has that same kind of feeling where you just get plunged into this world that just seems dank and dark. And around every corner, more and more of this guy's life gets peeled back and revealed after he gets out of jail. And we're about to get into some of the darker stuff, but like things are really bad for him and they just keep getting worse. And you're like, well, fuck, no wonder you joined a gang. Yeah, right. And yeah, the, the, the yeah, the world isn't all that great. They did uh, they did an excellent job of establishing that and every choice that our main character that we're supposed to be following makes makes perfect sense to me given the lack of options that he has. Like I can't really fault a lot of the decisions that he's making. And especially here, like he's just gotten out of prison and he's just trying to walk the straight and narrow and be a lone wolf and just do what he has to do to try and not have to go back to jail. And that's his main focus. So much so that he's like, Look, you guys don't know what it's like. Even his own family he's willing to throw under the bus like his big brother. Yeah. He's like, I'm not going back to fucking prison. Yeah, he's not. Um, he's not going to fight a security guard in the school parking lot just so yeah, his the, big brother can feel good about himself. The first, the first day he's gotten out. Right. Yeah. The very first day he gets out. Right. Because his older <laughs> brother's fucking hooked on drugs. <laughs> right. Um. All right. So then we start with the next twenty minutes. Uh, Cody goes home. We can't even see what a shit life he has to live. Uh, that his mom is a mess. She's also addicted to drugs. And her and his little brother get to fight over drugs. Um, They're fighting for the drugs. They're trying to get the supply. Yeah. He ran in and stole drugs from their mom so that he could give it to the older brother who was all beat up and cut up because he got left behind. And the mother and, and also the history teacher did that to him. No. All his chest. Yeah, he said the history, the new history teacher did it to him. He did say that at this point. Yep. Because yep. the guy, the uh, Cody asked, he goes, oh, the cops mess you up pretty good. And he goes, no, it's the new history teacher he goes I, something's wrong with that guy i thought he said it was the cops or the the guards that did it see that's what cody was inferring and then he goes no but it was the history teacher they took me to him so hmm, that's interesting i swear I never that's picked what I that up before said. so i'm i'm not in a position to argue and say no that's not the case and i'm not going to go grab the movie and start running it just to see for sure i'll just take your word for it and we'll move on all right um, so anyway, um, however, Cody has good news. His motorcycle was well taken care of, so he's very excited about that. Um, uh, so then the next day at school, the principal's daughter's heading into a class, and one of the, uh, a different gang member wants to, you know, starts hitting on her, and she has to be left alone, and so things get real rapey real quick. So then Cody jumps in and beats the shit out of the guy. Everything's going fine until robot gym teacher stops everything and drags Cody into the principal's office. The principal, someone admonishes him, saying, you know, hey, you're on probation, all that, and... Cody kind of angrily says, you know, hey, I stopped your daughter from being raped, shithead. Maybe, I mean, why is it the shit who tried to rape the daughter in there? Why is it Cody? Did you recognize the gym teacher guy? Did he pop up? Or He's been in everything. Yeah, I've seen him in a lot of things. I don't can name one thing right now, but I've seen him. I would say the one thing that most people would recognize him from is in the 90s version of The Stand. He was one of the yokels that kept giving Nick a lot of trouble right before shit hit the yes. fan. He was the yes. leader of the group that beat him up. He was the one with the ring and then he was the one that was like still alive and Nick was taking care of him at the very end. A lot of people will recognize yeah. him from that. Like that's what I always think of right off the bat when I see him. 
I mean, granted, he's been in a shit ton of movies and TV yeah. and all of that kind of stuff, but like that's the one that really definitely pops for me was... And he's the, always kind of an asshole. Yeah, I mean, like, he played a bad guy in The Replacement Killers. He was a bad guy in Last Man Standing, the... Bruce Willis movie that's basically just a take on Rashomon. He was okay. He was one of the fucking bad guys in the second Under Siege. I think he was like the main bad guy that uh, he was supposed to go up against. He was in a fucking. I know he was in a Jean Claude Van Damme movie. I just can't remember which one off the top of my head, but. <laughs> <laughs> usually he plays a heavy or he plays one of the bad guys that people are supposed to go up against you know like just like this badass because he's a big foreboding looking dude it was fucking death warrant that's he was a bad guy in death warrant that's what it was okay <laughs> but anyway <laughs> yeah i had to look it up just to see but anyway um the guy's been in like a ton of stuff and it's patrick kilpatrick is his name i recognize him from he is the bad guy with the diamond tooth in remo williams the adventure begins that remo ends up having to fight at a couple of different turns and then as as we were kind of discussing earlier, the main bully guy that's like the small town piece of shit that confronts Nick at the beginning of the stand right before stuff starts popping off and then the disease hits and Nick has to take care of him. Yes, yes. So yeah, the gym teacher's been in a lot of stuff. And uh, and so also, anyway, I mean, we're skipping over Pam Greer and we, we haven't talked yeah. about the history teacher just yet, but yeah. just wanted to mention that guy, Patrick Kilpatrick. And like, I don't think I have to go through the litany of things that Pam Greer's done. I think everybody in our audience knows now yeah, about Pam, Pam Greer. Greer's done. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the principal excuses him. Uh, he has to go to gym. So now they're in gym and the robot guy, he's being a prick to one of Cody's friends trying to make him do 200 pushups. And he's kind of just being a general, like, fucking bully prick. And so when class is over, he has Cody stay behind and he pretty much beats a living fuck out of Cody. Beats a living fuck out of him by like a lot. And I mean like bashing his chest to the point where he's bleeding out of his fucking mouth. Yeah, and- he uses his robot weight and he does it under the premise that he's trying to teach him how to wrestle. And then when Cody yeah. actually does a good job of wrestling with him, then he decides that it's time to beat the fuck out of Cody. And yeah, he fucking flattens him good for talking shit to him. And then during all this time, um, the kid who he's being a bully to gets high on edge and then grabs a gun and he kind of peters out and he really can't hold the gun very well because he's so high but the teacher gets up and snaps the kid's neck and Cody passes out after seeing that. Well that um, and also after having his chest caved in by a yeah, very yeah, heavy robot. He, he, just getting the shit kicked out of him. Yeah. <laughs> The uh, scientists freak out a little bit. And they're like, holy fuck, you know, you, you, what's going on? And main bad guy there, uh, Rat Tail, he's like, eh, don't worry about it. Uh, we're going to be fine. So and um, so then we cut to the old guy robot. And uh, he's kind of teaching them all uh, about war and shit. And Cody's older brother comes in all fucked up and he pukes. So the teacher then takes him to his locker, busts open the locker, finds all the drugs in it, and then starts making him do it and makes him OD and then he tears off the the locket um and this is why I don't think it's his brother um th- that character is not his brother it's just his friend because that locket he, Cody says that locket was given to him by his mother not Cody's mother but that kid's mother and he never takes it off and I don't think anybody cares about Cody's mom cuz she doesn't care about anybody I do believe that they might have the same dad, but different, uh, different so moms. half brothers. Yeah, that's gotcha. my thought. Well, anyway, he has that pendant, and he comes back in the class, starts talking, and Cody actually sees it. This is when Cody starts to realize that something is amiss, something is yeah. not right. I mean, he just got the ass kicked, and now I think you know he's probably wondering, well, maybe I didn't see the gym teacher break that kid's neck. Maybe I was so fucked up after getting my you know the shit beaten out of me. So now, but he's probably now like, okay, well, I, I think things are bad um things are being tough all over yes well the principal meets with the teachers and that is our next clip does anyone have an explanation ingestion of 8,000 milligrams of ethyl digimesothol will do that break the boy's neck pulverize his jaw the effects of habitual use are indeed disturbing mr hardin you beat that boy only in self-defense miles the filthy little punk was armed with a dangerous weapon. And he was out of control on narcotics. Ethyl digimesothal is notorious for producing acts of superhuman strength. Mr. Langford, the news crew is here. Thank you, Wanda. You'll have to excuse me. I have statements to make, people to placate. Dr. Forrest, we'll discuss this later. Alone. Of 
course, Miles. Whatever you say. All right, so the history teacher we got to talk about, and we'll just kind of talk about everybody that's in here. People should recognize Stacey Keach. They should know about Stacey Keach and his whole history because he's also one of those that guy actors. But yeah. The history teacher, the real evil older dude, you got to recognize him from stuff, right? Oh, of course. Yeah. I recognize all three of the. T- that's why I'm saying this movie. I, I recognize almost everybody in this movie as somebody I've seen somewhere. He was the bad guy in Death Wish 4. You should know him from that because that's like oh. your, that's the one that you like of the later sequels even more that's than 3. That's true. You like yeah. 4 even more than 3, you said. Yes. Um, I recognize him. He was the principal in 3 O'Clock High. And when I saw 3 O'Clock High, it was after I had seen Class of 1999. So I thought that 3 O'Clock High was a sort of unofficial sequel to Class of 1999 as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was the principal, Mr. O'Rourke. And 3 O'Clock High is, I can't recommend that enough. That's a fucking amazing movie. Yeah. Yeah, so Class of 1990, Delta Force, bunch of other fucking movies as well. Bad guy in uh, Death Wish 4. Uh, I know he popped up in Hoffa. I think he was even in one of the episodes. He was like a sheriff or something like that in the Adventures of Briscoe County. And he's done a bunch of fucking background uh, supporting type actor role where you needed somebody to be badass and just talk with the New York's a- accent. I'm trying to think. There's there's definitely a movie that I saw him in that I think it might have been a Larry Cohen movie, but I can't think of which one it was off the top of my head. So I'll just move on. But anyway, bunch of stuff for John P. Ryan. All right. And uh, so then with all that, uh, Cody and Christine question her dad, but he sticks to the official story that the kid had an uh, overdose. As they're leaving, Cody swipes like a book from uh, the receptionist's desk. Uh, We'll find out what that is later. Uh, And then Cody and Christine have a little bit of a fight where, because, you know, he doesn't believe her dad and she does. Um, And then um, later that night, the principal and our uh, rat-tailed friend, they are uh, uh, talking at dinner and um he's like don't worry about it uh he's like number one you're complicit in covering up a murder so we're in this together and then mainly he's like don't worry about it i'm gonna get all this money all this but you're gonna get all the glory you're gonna be on the cover of time magazine you're gonna be the man who will clean up schools he goes you're gonna get all the props and i don't need them i just want the money so uh that's the end of that 20 minutes we should also talk our main man cody here he was one of the characters in stand by me I know. He was also Philip, the one who gets destroyed by the puppet version that Freddy makes out of him in Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Yes, he is. Thank you. That's where I knew that guy. All right. Thank you. He had a brief role in Lonesome Dove. Uh, He had basically one of those background supporting actor type roles in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Do you remember those thugs that Indy takes on whenever he's River Phoenix as a kid? Yes. He was one of those thugs in uh, Last Crusade. I got you, yeah. But it's the same actor. He's been in a ton of other stuff. He was in, like, Fire in the Sky as well. And then uh, there was a remake of a Swedish film called Night Watch. He was in the American version of that, um, I believe. But he was, like, just, like, a background character there. I'm just trying to remember everything I can think I can see him in. But that's that's just about everything I can remember right now off the top of my head. He's been in a ton of stuff. But most people is going to recognize him as Philip in A Nightmare on Elm Street. That's where he's probably most prominently recognizable for our audience. All right, yeah, and now that you mention it, it's like, oh, it always bummed me out with his death, even though it was one of the cooler deaths. Well, the that. worst part about it is he's awake and conscious the whole time this is happening, but he's trapped in the dream yeah, while it's happening in reality. fucking being sliced open and made to walk like that. Yeah, and he's feeling all of that pain, even though nobody else can see it, and then he's walking this long, arduous staircase begging for help in his life, and the film yes. makes you watch it. It's really disheartening. It, it, it really is. It's a, it's a way to start out the murdering, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, it's really dark. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, to start the next 20 minutes, um, Cody goes to his gang's hideout, and they are initiating his little brother by, you know, beating the shit out of him. Then, they kick him out, and that is also a ass-whooping of epic proportions, apparently, to get kicked out of the game. So, the next day, Cody finds Christine, talks her into helping him, uh, coming with him, skipping school, and they go, and they, he, the, what he stole off the receptionist's desk was the teacher directory. And he goes, look up the new teacher's addresses, because he wants to find the pendant that he saw the old guy had. 
and they find all three new teachers at the same address. So they go to the house, and it sparsely has anything in it, but like tanks and stuff. There's like three chairs, tanks, WD-40, things for machines, hardly any clothing. It's very weird. Uh, and then he finds the pendant. His girl also goes on a diatribe about how she only has one lacy bra and that women always have panties to match. They yeah. always try to match things, and then she's just basically trying to illustrate like, no woman buys just a fancy bra. They always have panties to match and there's nothing else here yeah. but a fancy bra. You know, she's trying to explain this to him in a very delicate way, you know. And he's just like <laughs> he's just, she's just Captain Oblivious because all he's thinking about is her tits because she keeps holding the bra up to her own tits. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> Cody's not the smartest hero. No, no. He's the hero but he's kind of stupid. So <laughs> he's got the balls to get you through, but not the brains. Yeah, exactly. So then the three teachers get back and they kind of run out of the house and the, the teachers see him and they get on the bike. Um, so he drops Christine off and tells her to run. So, uh, and he gets out and they chase him in a car and through some cat and mouse chasing throughout the city, a pretty good car chase. Now, it's not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah, none of the action is bad in this. The action is no. spot on. I've, everything yeah. that they do for the fights, the action, all of these various sequences is impeccable. Yeah, and they um they get the he gets them to drive their car off of unfinished bridge into the water. Yeah, they're so focused on attacking him that you know he just basically leads them off the edge of the bridge and they don't even care. Yeah. So um later on yeah, he gets home and he's talking to his brother. And uh, they're kind of, you know, making up and shit like that, his little brother. And then the teachers are emerging from the water, and they say that they have to do something different. Now it's time to go to war. And then uh, he and his little brother play some basketball, and he has to leave so he can do his homework and all that kind of shit. So later on that night, the teachers jump Cody's little brother. They chase him down and kill him. This was really creepy yeah. how they're driving past him in the car and they trick him into the car and shit. It's just really Well, they say they trick him into the car. They they stop him there and then they go, well, you know, gang activity will lead you nowhere. And he goes, what do you want from me? Uh, and she goes, and then Pam Greer goes, we just want to teach you a lesson. And then the gym teacher goes, I want to kick his butt. And they must have ran out of how many swears they could put in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, they chase him down and then they kill him. And then later on that night, the leaders jump another different gang, a, ga a guy from the other gang, and they light him on fire and throw him through the window of that other gang's hideout. Yeah, they're, so they are like, it's it's wartime. They're setting up a gang war. Right. They're trying to get one gang to fight the other gang by killing opposite members and blaming the opposite gangs. It's a pretty yeah. standard thing. It's basically like grabbing your princess and taking her from Gilda all the way to... <laughs> Florin or whatever that nation was and killing her over there so yeah, yeah, you yeah. can start a war. <laughs> it's inconceivable, inconceivable, but it works. It's, it's, it works, but it's inconceivable. You are trying to kidnap what I've rightfully stolen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. That whole conversation's great. Uh, okay, so Cody is driving around, and he finds the rest of the gang with his brother's dead body. He freaks out, yells at him to reinstate him, so they beat the shit out of him, and he wants to go to war with the other gang, because the other day, the in blood written on the basketball is like, meet at this place at what time? Well, it's, for, it says for, war... For yeah, it says, like, war zone or whatever, so apparently yeah. they have this designated area to, to shoot out by the docks or whatever, and that's what that is. The uh, scientists are getting worried because now the teachers are nowhere to be found and that's our next yeah, clip check nine again what about Forrest? he's on his way why the panic gentlemen the teachers are not in their room sir they can't be monitored when they're not here there's nothing to worry about marvin they made the decision not to teach today that's all but they're supposed to do what they're programmed to do sir nothing more but with the reasoning powers of a human being. Find them, shut them down, and run a complete test. No matter how perfect they are in the field, Dr. Forrest, there's no such thing as a completely stable hybrid. Or a completely stable human being. I don't want them taken out of the field right now, and that's an order, do you understand? They've almost made a complete emotional crossover to human modes. Worst case scenario, sir, the educational directives may have miscarried. They might be reverting back to their original military form. You let me worry about that, all right, Spence? 
So now you can see there's panic setting in for everyone but Rat Tail. And uh, it's wartime. We get a lot of fighting, gunfighting, explosions. Uh, the gang fighting's full on. The teachers show up and they start strategically killing people on both gangs. At one point, Cody and another guy, they're in and they're kind of sneaking up behind the main bad guy or the main leader of the other gang. Um, and then all of a sudden, arms reach out. They grab the other kid who Cody's with, and they bends him in half, pulling him through the hole. That I was thought cool. that was pretty fucking awesome. Yeah, the gore effects in this are also on point. This is yeah. during the height of the practical effects era, and they nail just about everything that they try to pull off in this. With a few exceptions that we'll get to towards the end of the movie, but, I mean, the carnage and the gore factors of the deaths in this are spot on. They're as good as it gets for practical effects they did a really good job with a lot of that yeah i agree i i thought this looked really cool and um uh so then he uh, cody sees the teacher and teacher's like you're next and he's like uh and he shoots him a couple times and he doesn't go down he's like fuck so cody runs off and he gets away and that ends that 20 minutes block of the movie interesting strategy that the teachers have and it's at some point it's not quite yet that we get revealed what these uh robotic creatures were originally built for we don't have that inclination just yet stacy keach hasn't given up that ghost yeah okay yeah yeah we don't know yet what they are but we just know that things are really wrong right the what we think is them malfunctioning right now and the way that they're acting they're doing it in such a strategically methodically plotted out way that it seems as though there is more programming to these teachers than simply just being teachers with the ability to fight and or defend themselves against unruly children there's another layer of something going on here and this whole sequence really unveils that because they execute several of these fucking gang kids specifically just to get them out of the schools and to try and clean up the schools but they do it with such precision striking tact that it's clear that there's some kind of tactical know-how in these things more so than just being teachers there's something else going on with them and i think that really gets established through this section of the film so we're basically talking about it in thirds and the first third sets up the world sets up what's going on with the teachers gets you ready to go the second set of 20 minutes here that we have or this middle third of the film is basically establishing the gangs versus these robotic psycho teachers and then the big cover-up that's insisting over top of this that even the principal's now brought into as well. And so when we come to the close, it's clear the kids are on their own and if they're going to survive, they're going to have to fight back and defend themselves. I mean, that's what we have established here right at the end with this battle. This was the turning point that, you know, there's no way back for these kids, <laughs> yeah. these teachers. So, I mean, the, the film's very tight. It's very concise. The, the plot line flows exactly as you need it to. And I can be perfectly honest with you. You can watch this a ton of times, not even pay a shitload of attention and the plot line will still get you. It will still fucking stick with you because this film makes sure that it drives that home to you. Yes. No fucking eyeballs and tits crying and making a spider giant. Yeah. Thank you. Fucking God. <laughs> uh, it, it picked this movie, picked a story, how it wanted to tell that story. And then it just stuck to it. <laughs> <laughs> it executed things methodically, <laughs> thoughtfully created a storyline, set up suspicion before the payoff, did everything that, you know, script writing and storytelling should do. It's fucking beautiful. <laughs> I'm so happy that we covered this this week. <laughs> I uh, me too. So we go to the last one third now of the movie. Uh, Cody then uh, talks to his gang and he tells them what he saw about the teacher and everything. And they're all kind of freaking out about it. Then Cody talks to Christine and her dad was already told that they were at the teacher's apartment. And so they're all kind of her dad doesn't want to see t him either because, of course, the teacher lied. Uh, but then the principal, he talks to the fucking robots whatever they are in our next clip you, know, you people have had total freedom that doesn't give you a license to murder miles you petitioned for kennedy high school to be used as an experiment in disciplinary education yes but not to use my school as a war zone we had a new product to market and this was a perfect place to test it in yes but these androids were supposed to educate the students battle droids miles battle droids military surplus marked to be shipped to central america for the 10-year war that is, until the DED called. It seemed they were having a little problem in our schools. I said, no problem. All we have to do is marry our war machine with the basic educational model. Wonderful results. <laughs> you should have seen those Washington assholes. They were amazed. 
And now we've got a military contract worth billions. I see. So they've been waging war with my students. Well, isn't that what all teachers do? But my people aren't just fighting, Miles. They're winning. Whatever happened to education? The students can learn if they want to. They simply have to make the right choice. Sure. Learn or be killed. I want you to turn them off. I'm terminating this program. I'm afraid that's the bad news, Marzi. Once this program has been implemented, I'm afraid it can't be turned off. The bottom line is kill the enemy. All right. So is Stacy Keach saying that they're using the kids and this gang controlled land to show how they can infiltrate enemy territory and that they're taking over and they're fighting a war? And this was never for the Department of Education. This was just like a test zone. Well, I don't think it's a test zone. I think it was just another place to quell. Yeah, these were going to be built and put into a, a, a war that the United States was going to start internationally um, that but not be a part of. So it's going to be against two warring factions to cause instability in the area and the robots were going to help but then before any of that could go into the issues with these like fucking the gangs and everything else has gotten so bad that now they have to put them in mode here in america but either way they're gonna make a lot of fucking money yeah so he's basically saying that they're repurposing it for the schools but they're doing what their original plan that they were meant to do what they were supposed to execute they're just basically doing that for the gangs so they're killing two birds with one stone in his mind and it's working perfectly and now he has proof that they will do exactly what they were programmed either way and blah 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 make sure loads of money is his end goal here with his albino self yes exactly and his rat tail because rat tails like that need a lot of money to for upkeep (laughs) it requires someone to trim it just right you know much you know the special kind of conditioner you gotta use i mean listen hair care is not something you and i know fuck all about but (laughs) having a rat tail may have been something i knew something about when i was like seven that's fucking awesome (laughs) Yeah, but that's back when it was like in style and cool, like around the same era time frame that, you know, this movie took place seven years after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true, too. (laughs) (laughs) Like this movie was shot in the 90s. Rat Tails stopped being cool about 86. Yeah, but this is supposed to be 1999. So they probably thought the retro look would kick back in. Either that or that albino just gives zero fucks about his rat tail. Yeah, that too. Uh, this is like women's shoulder pads. We're getting obsessed over it. Yeah, exactly. Only Jesus. People are going to be like, why are you guys so into this motherfucker's rat tail? Because like, it's glorious and it reminds me of both Sting and Brian Bosworth around the same time. It's, it's just, it's a fucking, it's very powerful. <laughs> it's a rat tail of majestic, <laughs> breathtaking splendor. <laughs> it's, it's, it's there. And if the rat tail were to run for president, I'd vote for it. Just saying. (laughs) But not the man, just the rat tail. Well, the principal is killed uh, by one of the robots, like, clenching right into his neck. Did you see the wire that was supporting Malcolm McDowell in that scene? No, I didn't. Yeah, you could see it. It's just... I was actually looking at the neck wound as it was going in because I thought it was so cool looking. Right. Well, the effect really kind of covers it up, but I noticed it this time around. There's a wire that's uh, basically like the wire they're using to help pull Malcolm McDowell up so they don't have to worry about everything else with the wound and everything. But there's there was a wire there. Oh, nice. Well, well, I still thought the wound was cool looking. No, yeah. Like, we already talked about the gore effects yeah, in this practical, one point. Yeah, they're really good. The practical effects are really good. Um, all right. So the leader of the Razorheads, he gets a call and he goes, all right, I'll be there. And he said, tells him one of his buddies that it's Cody and that he's supposed to meet him for a one-on-one at the school. And the guy goes, do you trust him? He goes, yeah, yeah. Just like I trust a vampire for a blowjob. I'm like, that's... uh. That's good. That's that's a good one. So uh, anyway, uh, the uh, Pam robot then she breaks into the principal's house and grabs Christine, and she calls Cody in the voice of Hector, saying to meet him at the school and that he has Christine. Cody and his gang talk about it, and they're like, "Why would you want to go to school?" And then they figure out it it must be the actually the teachers who are doing this. So then Cody and Hector will and their all their gangs will they meet up at the school, and that's our final clip. He called me out. Wrong, Hector. You see, someone's running a game on us. The same game that killed my brother. The same game that killed Noser. You killed Noser. I didn't kill anyone. And I'm not here to fight you. You got no choice. 
Back me up, Kurt. No, 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 jefe. No one's gonna back you up. Mind is a precious thing to waste, Cody. Don't make me waste yours. Inside this school are three inhuman teaching monsters. The ones running this game. They kidnapped my girl. They killed Sonny, Reedy, Mohawk. And Noza, an angel. I can't believe you. You're, you're fucking talking shit about your own brother. And Sonny was an edgehead, man. He OD'd. One of these teachers killed him and took this. It's got his blood all over it. You gotta know who your real enemies are. Now I'm going in there to waste some teachers. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah they're with him. So they're like, fuck it, let's kill some folks. And uh, they go ahead, they blow up the gates of the school, and they all go riding through there looking for people. Uh, we do cut, and we see all the other scientists are dead. They've been fucking just mauled to fucking death. So they're just no more scientists anymore. Yeah, they uh, all voiced too many objections, so Stacey yeah. Keats had the robots take them all out. So uh, they, as they ride through, we finally see um, the Pam robot, uh, and she stops them, and they kind of shoot her up a bit, and she's like, uh-uh, and then her arm does something weird, and it transforms into a fucking flamethrower arm and she lights some people on fire so they go running from her are you gonna are all... you not gonna talk about how her chest comes open and you see like all of these tanks with the flamethrowers and these fake yeah. tits just sitting on top of her already ample bosoms I was, I was gonna go with the fake tits when you really saw it better and the uh in the scene right before she dies the problems that i have with the practical effects in this are the robotics they don't i don't want to say make sense that's not the quite the right way to go about it but whenever the robotics are revealed um the way they go about accenting where the robotics are supposed to be make them less believable because they're building this huge chest appliance over top of pam greer's already ample bosoms and yeah. when they do the reveal of the gears underneath you can tell that she's yeah, it's just, a weird it's it's a weird walk she has to do right she's uncomfortable and she can't hold herself in such a way is because they're trying to cover up her body by making this robotic body go over top of it and the the way that they're lighting it the way that they show it she just looks humongous now now because she is because they have this huge thing built on top of her you know her body and it just doesn't work right and it's all supposed to be covering up her breasts which you know you can see where they're trying to do that with the way that they did the makeup and it just doesn't quite work and then they have the two giant rubber falsies over top of that i'm guaranteeing you that probably put like another 35 40 maybe 75 pounds on her oh Oh, yeah no wonder she couldn't walk right and she gets it the worst out of everybody for the makeup to look like a robot yeah because they really have her all shot up and shit and kind of torn up right i mean Um, it still looks great don't get me wrong what i'm really doing here is nitpicking because i've done nothing but suck this movie off since we started covering it so i needed to bring that in so then the um fucking gym teacher robot shows up and his arm transforms into a fucking little rocket launcher so he blows some kid right through a fucking wall and uh then we cut to cody he finds christy and is able to free her and one of his buddies shows up and is kind of watching the door and then the old guy robot shows up and his hand turns into a claw that has a drill in it and he drills right into his buddy's forehead and then he kind of has to claw on him but cody grab is able to grab his gun puts the gun muzzle into the guy's mouth and blows the entire back of his head off killing the old guy robot finally that was a pretty cool death yeah that was actually really cool i was like oh, i'm only gonna get out of this one and then when he did that i was like all right that's cool that's that's cool i like that that was like total destruction is what it took well he also um, did that and he delivered one of those like real famous action movie type lines you know yeah i was like i guess i'm i guess you, it really drilled into me or something like that i yeah i don't remember exactly what it was that he said but he delivers one of those action hero lines and then blows his head off with like it's a six shooter it's one of those like revolvers but it's like one of the judge types where it's like a really big fucking gun so it yeah. might just be a five shooter and he pulls the trigger until it goes click on that teacher's head and even though it's robotic stuff that's supposed to be inside they do a really good job of making the head explode and making you believe that he shot the fuck out of this guy's head until it just became jelly yeah uh, it was really cool looking yeah. uh, so they run and then the pam robots chase them so they go into her classroom the chemistry room and they turn on all the gas and they're kind of hiding and as she walks up he throws an axe into her stomach also functioning the the gas lines in her stomach 
she goes to turn on the flame, but it blows her the fuck up. I thought that was a pretty cool way to do that. It's weird that the robots aren't assessing the damage that's happening to them or the danger factor that could happen from what it is that they're doing there. They're pulling a, to- a Terminator. Kind of, yeah. But the way that, that none of the damage is supposed to matter. Well, I can see where they would be like that during their battle mode and everything. But like, if she knew she was leaking fluid that was explosive, she should have sensors that should tell her. That. It also could. It also could be that I think part of this is also they're trying to point out that the robots are failing, so they're not seeing this because they're they're failing. Technically, they're failures, and they don't know like what's going on with their programming anymore. So they've technically failed. Just Rattail doesn't want anybody to know that. Yeah, I could totally see that. And he's thinking this is a way to do the redemption or what have you. But kill kill all the fucking kids, and then the robots will just die on their own. And then problem solved. He walks away scot free. No one knows. Did you notice? No the, one knows what happens. Did you notice whenever the axe hits her uh, tanks or whatever, the writing on that is backwards on the tanks? No, I didn't say that. Yeah, they reversed the shot so that they could have the axe like land where they needed it to land, and they just basically pulled it out. Yeah, so that's because hilarious. They, because they reversed that shot, it also reversed the the words that were on the tank <laughs> don't get me wrong it still looks cool i just noticed that that's fucking hilarious um so okay so then the gym teacher is chasing up and hector is distracting him so he's trying to shoot hector with his missiles but hector's moving around and cody gets one like this big school bus that's been converted of course into this mad max slender dome type shit and he runs down these uh the teacher they all decide to go checking to see hector and cody and christine decide to go see if there are any survivors and there are none from either gang it appears to be a heavy death toll day and as they're checking out they hear some noise and they think it's one of their motorcycles to get on it's actually a robotic arm well at this point rat tail takes christine hostage and it's like unfortunately you're all just gonna have to die and then hector tries to throw a knife and he gets shot for his effort and then right as he's about to shoot cody we all of a sudden see a stirring upstairs and it's the gym teacher robot and he pulls kind of a t2 type thing where or terminator type thing where he's just kind of all fucked up in kind of a robot now oh that's uh, very much a terminator kind of thing yeah. that they're trying to do and this puppet actually looks really great they do a great job with it and they integrate I, the actor's face enough to where they're doing shots of just his face with some makeup for some yeah. of his facial reactions but it's only really bad whenever it's wide and they have the shots of what's supposed to be what's left of the actor's face for the cyborg part over top yeah. of the metal. That's where it gets a little cornball, but, and it does, it's moves real stiff, like a puppet and everything, but it still looks pretty fucking cool. And they do some really cool stuff with this thing. Yeah. Especially for Brian with the budget they had, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's there. This uh, finale is clearly where they're spent. All of their money is all of the explosions and everything. Yeah. But we've had really great action building up to it to this point. I'm sure a lot was spent on the game war yeah that, I mean, was, that was a lot of explosions too and bullets and all sorts of shit yeah, yeah. This, this back like uh, half of this film like once the the battle happens in the gangland just just does not let up and it's just more and more effects more and more practical explosions and then you get this like half robot cyborg looking dude running around trying to fucking explode people with shit it's still yeah. pretty decent yeah um, so anyway, he pun he comes up and he punches a hole through Rattail's stomach, killing him. Uh so then he knocks out Cody and then Christine tries to run away and he kinda gets up and she's like climbing something, he gets up to her. Well Cody wakes up and he grabs a forklift and kinda traps him in there, and she uses like this chain to kinda hang him there. And they eventually are able to destroy him, killing him. And as we end it, Cody and Christine walk out of the school alone. Roll credits. The way they kill the final robot, the gym teacher guy, is really fucking cool. So he's choking out or trying to do some stuff to Christy, but he's like also rapey robot time while he's doing it. It yeah. just feels creepy and greasy while he's doing this shit. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a fucking forklift drives through the robot and spears him, but also misses Christy. It goes through just enough that it misses yes. the chick. Because at first I'm like, oh my God, did he just kill his girlfriend? Because 
Right. Hard, hard. Right. And then she's got a hold of the chain and he's like, like trying to choke her with the chain or some shit like that. I can't remember exactly what it is, but then Cody has her wrap the chain around the robot's neck. And then he just basically starts doing wheelies until he tightens the chain so much it rips the head of the robot off, which is fucking amazing. And you hear the robot screaming and like being filled with fear, which doesn't make sense, but is still kind of (laughs) cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's just like a really great way that like he just rips the fucking head off the last robot to kill him. And then they're off to their bright future after the lawsuit that will happen from this corporation that's going to settle for a whole bunch of money in an NDA. Yeah, yeah. They're all going to be fucking rich. Or at least those two are going to be really fucking rich. And they got some death benefits to be paid out, too, with their family members yeah. being murdered by these robots. Exactly. Yeah. So, all's well that ends well, right? Yeah, everybody's happy now. You know, everything's yeah. everything's fine. It doesn't matter that all these people were murdered. This, ah, is, fuck this is probably one of the darker sci-fi action movies that you're going to catch from this yeah. era. I mean, it's like a dark world that feels like there's no hope for any of these people. And then you throw on top of that these murderous, psychotic robots robot teachers <laughs> yeah not only are they in destitute poverty and hopeless drug addiction now murderous robot teachers <laughs> good thing stuff like that will never happen here in america right matt mm, fuck well vote for trump and it's gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th- I was watching this and it was feeling really, really pressy. And I'm like, holy shit, man. The world that they predicted, they were just, you know. They're just about 10 years, years off. 20 years <laughs> off, yeah. 21 or so years off from yeah, what yeah. was about to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 20 years off. 20 years off, yeah. Go- Close. Governments Close. using drones to murder people from afar and get away with it. I mean, that's not too much further from robot teachers <laughs> sending kids yeah, right. to school in environments that are definitely deadly and will get them killed only because it's just the easier thing to do to herd them all into schools. Well, might as well just kill all the poors. Then we don't have to worry about them anymore, right? <laughs> yeah. That's... Why are the poor? Why are the poors getting so uppity all of a sudden? That's that's kind of where we're headed with this. Uh, there's some really decent social commentary woven through through this film to where if you aren't looking for it you won't notice it it's just another shithole world and things have just gone wrong and robots are killing people but if you really kind of look at it they're trying to find oh. a way to keep the economically disparaged inner cities yeah there's a down. lot of good message in this yeah and a the, lot of good message in this especially the idea that the things have gotten so bad that there are parts of the city that the police won't even enter i mean it was like that in la in the 90s it was like that in a lot of other cities and even parts of chicago are starting to get like that as well there are areas where they're not policed because the gangs are too tough and the police don't want to work hard at murdering black people yeah yeah (laughs) pretty much i mean holy fuck yeah i mean it's sad but yeah i I mean it's the old adage of keep the poor poor so the rich can get richer yeah and they're literally just testing things out because they know no one's going to question what happened in this war zone because people are dying all the time anyway which is very much a united states move Oh, big time. Yeah. Yeah, That's a perfect place to try shit out. America's a bunch of cunts. (laughs) Yeah, this this third world uh, city life that they're experiencing is happening all over the world, and we're doing the horrible shit that we're seeing these robots do. So there's a whole bunch of fucking commentary that could be had and analyzed in this film, but we ain't got the time to do that. We're going to just move on. (laughs) <laughs> yeah right yeah it's it's an excellent film i highly recommend it if you haven't seen class of 1999 yet and believe me we haven't really spoiled anything we've gone through this very quickly there's still tons of little things in this film to enjoy the practical effects alone are worth the price of admission if you can't find it on prime or something like that to watch yeah right. yeah exactly i think i'm good you ready to move on we'll uh we'll do some psyop news and call it a day yeah let's do it all right here we go We're gonna take a little break here we're gonna play the corrupted youth promo we'll have a little bit more of that cyberpunk music Music that I'm so hooked on because it fits for this week for sure. And when we come back, we'll do the PSYOP news. Taste colors beyond any known spectrum as phonic euphoria cascades into your consciousness. Observe the laws of physics no longer applying to an existence that confines. Space and time will unravel and reform to a screaming new dawn, bursting with infinite possibility. It's as easy as listening to the Corrupted Youth Podcast, where the father-son duo of Dan and Brennan explore the latest blockbusters, classic genre films, and the schlockier of Golden Age VHS rental store flicks in spoiler-heavy fashion. Corrupted Youth Podcast is available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, 
Spotify, Google Play, and more. Take a break from reality, unlock your infinite cosmic potential, and become a dongle. Cyberpunk zone now. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're awesome. <laughs> yes. We were not awesome in the previous 264 episodes. It's not until. <laughs> not until the cyberpunk kicks in. That's when you start getting awesome. I think everyone knows that. <laughs> I played cyberpunk on previous episodes, but it's not yeah, until we have cyberpunk world with cyberpunk music that we're awesome. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty exact. You got you to gotta follow some fucking rules. Well, let's just ruin everything and you can give me some science. Uh, it's from Chris. That's our man Chris on the ground in Wisconsin reporting. Yes, good guy. Good guy. Um, anyway, a lone pilot tells LH Tower, we just passed a guy in a jetpack. FBI now investigating. I got Botox in my scrotum. What does that have to do with a jetpack? I have no idea. I just sometimes like people to know what I'm doing. America you know? is a bunch of cunts. I think uh, people care about my, uh, my needs. And uh, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, but the FBI, yes, has uh, launched an investigation after an American Airlines pilot said he saw what appeared to be a man flying with a jetpack Sunday night near Los Angeles International Airport. And Satan's cock. It, whoa, holy shit. And Satan's cock? And uh, Satan's that's an cock. That's an, active, that's an active night. Uh, that's a very active night. He must have Shut up. Are you talking about penises? penises? Uh, anyway, they say Tower, uh, the uh, pilot was quoted as Tower, American 90, uh, 1997. We just passed a guy in a jetpack. The first American Airlines pilot states in a call to the control tower. That or they just Amer- had a bukkake mouth party. I, I, you know, I don't know what they're doing on the plane. Um, I don't think they'd be doing that, but what do I know? All Shooting right? a fucking hot uh, load all over this dog. That seems not to be that. I mean, why would you do that? Poor fucking dog. I'm just saying that. It's micro penis um, time. And then, so then the dispatcher was asking if they were off to the uh, right or left side, which has to feel nice when they're taking you seriously like that, you know? <laughs> I think they are required to take the report whenever it's put in. Yeah, take everything as seriously as you can or else, you know, yeah. you could probably get in trouble for not. Right. Um. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, so then they said on the, the pilot said he was on the left side, maybe 300 yards or so and about their altitude. Uh, they said, we just saw a guy pass us by at a jet pack. The second pilot for JetBlue Airways that tells the tower, which warned another pilot about the sighting only in LA, the air traffic controller could said at one point, <laughs> I, <laughs> holy shit. What? <laughs> Uh, FBI China's- spokeswoman uh, Laura Emler said Tuesday the agents at LAX were investigating after the pilot reported the incident to the control tower. The FBI is aware of the reports by pilots on Sunday. It was working to determine what occurred, uh, the agency has said in a statement. Ooh, is that me getting a metal rod shoved up my rectum? Because it might be aliens. Uh, yeah, it's got to be aliens. Uh, it's aliens. Or, or Iron Man. Uh, but most likely alien. What's with all that asshole uh, creep? Well, see, a jetpack could very well burn your ass, which you would definitely need that cream for. Yeah, 
Yeah, what is with that all that asshole cream, though? Because it's super hot, you should be able to fuck one time. Totally agree. Um, so anyway, uh, the two airline flight crews reported seeing what appeared to be someone in a jetpack as they were on their final approach to Lax around 6.35 p.m. on Sunday. Whoever this guy or person could be a woman, whoever this person is, is a fucking legend right I now. I started doing drugs after that. <laughs> I mean, who knew you could get that kind of fucking activity out of a fucking jetpack. Well, do jetpacks actually work? And I'm not talking about the ones that just spray water into the air from a lake whenever you're Well, apparently they lake. do. I mean, what else is this guy doing? <laughs> Uh, it could be a drone disguised to look like it's flying a human being with a mannequin. Oh, maybe. Maybe. I uh, mean. I've seen somebody that outfitted a drone to look like it was a Grim Reaper flying across the sky to freak people out and chase them with it. That's true. I mean, I don't know why I have to go ruining our good time. But, uh. <laughs> They say everyone's looking into these reports now, so... Um, Shoot some Richard, fucking ropes. Richard Winton is an investigative crime writer for the Los Angeles Times and part of the team that won the Pulitzer Prize for public service in 2011. Uh, oh, fuck. I'm sorry. This is just that guy who wrote the story. That was his thing. So never mind. Uh, but pull there you go. Just to uh, pull it. Either A, uh, somebody dressed up a drone looking real nice, or B, somebody made an incredible new dra- jetpack. And tested it out by an airport so people could see and report report on it yeah yeah and and now we have iron man flying around and you're like well fuck <laughs> no you see it was a weather balloon matt and then swamp gas was reflecting off of the weather balloon and made it look like a person in a jetpack oh yeah yeah it's that damn swamp gas i knew it <laughs> yeah it's either that or the fucking rocketeer is a real thing now and we all have to be afraid yay the rocketeer he's our hero <laughs> I actually really like the Rocketeer, mostly because of that kick-ass jacket that he wears. Is that a kick-ass jacket? Yeah. <laughs> Has nothing to do with the fact that, you know, Jennifer Connelly was his girlfriend in that movie, and she was it, playing that, a Betty Page-like I, character. I don't even know who that is, because, yeah, I, I don't even know what's going on there. Who knows who Jennifer Connelly is? Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> no clue. No one has no, any idea how hot no, Jennifer Connelly is. No one knows about that kind of hotness. We all just, we all just shut up. <laughs> well, speaking of shutting up, I think I've had about enough for this fucking episode. We're going to cut this one short. So we're going to play the Ending Legion promo. We're going to have a little bit more of that synth wave style music. And when we come back, we will close out this 1999 centric show. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.
pick a little happier music to yeah. bring us out and just make us all peaceful and just glad that we have our lives and that our world is nowhere near as dark and as awful as we've seen it in class of 1999. There's nothing anywhere near as horrendously awful happening in our world like is what's going on in 1999. I wish you weren't so fucking awkward, bud. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you would like to know some uh, more times when this show has been really fucking awkward, you can check out our landing and launching page, legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. That's where you're going to get our previous 264 episodes. 200. 264 episodes. That's yeah, fucking yeah. ridiculous. That is awesome. <laughs> We also have our Facebook group where you can talk about how you're tired of us bragging about how many consecutive episodes we've been able to release. That is Cinema Fuck you guys. We on earned Facebook. That shit. Well, I earned it. You earned some of it. Well, I'm still going to take credit for it. I don't give a <laughs> shit. <laughs> you were a part of the Rhythm Nation. You're not the whole. I never said I was the whole Rhythm Nation. <laughs> we're all just a part of the Rhythm Nation, Matt. <laughs> Great, now that song's gonna be in my head all night. You Fuck. can find well, there goes sleep. You can find me on Facebook. I am Court Psyops, who is also a part of the Rhythm Nation. Matt is also Are you, available. Are you though part of the Rhythm Nation? Matt is also available on Facebook and is part of the Rhythm Nation. He is Matt Psyop. You can email feedback to Matt, Psyopmat at gmail.com. Let them know that the two rules of Rhythm Nation are you don't talk about Rhythm Nation. <laughs> so wait, Rhythm Nation runs on the same rules as Fight Club? We don't talk about Rhythm Nation, Matt. You can email Holy feedback fu- okay. to cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com. Let them know that Rhythm Nation does not work like that in any way, shape, or form. I, yeah, I just I don't see how that's going to work like that for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you can tweet a couple of tweets to a couple of twats on the hate-filled shit fest that knows more about the Rhythm Nation than you. That is Twitter. I'm at court underscore psyop, and he is at psyop Matt. You can also check us out on Instagram, where I am running that shit like this show. It's yeah. cinema underscore psyops, and that is where all of the memes that I'm repurposing get posted, and then they are reshared to other social media platforms from there. But the Instagram is where you're going to get the freshest stolen memes. And by uh, freshest, oh, I mean just their repurposed. First. They're not stolen. They're not stolen. They're, they're, they're the groups. They're for everyone. <laughs> we re- they're, but they are the of the highest of quality of memes. <laughs> and they are all there for our fellow comrades in the Rhythm Nation. Yes, that's right. The Rhythm Nation is definitely uh, at least socialist, if, if not communist. But <laughs> well, while you're out there trying to seize the means of production in the Rhythm Nation, kick the fuck out of the capitalist pig dogs and this weekend make it your bitch. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you now. <laughs> All right. Your Skype get reset on you like it did to me? Uh, maybe. I don't think so. Hold on. Everything looks to be... As long oh, as your recorder gets your microphone, it's fine. And as long yeah. as I can understand you while we're doing this, it's fine. Cool. <laughs> yeah, my, my, yeah, my audacity is picking up my microphone, so... All right. So you're recording? And I am recording now. One, two, three... Okay, I am rolling on my side, so I'm good to go if you are. I kind of just want to get this episode uh, out of the way so I can go back to enjoying my day off. (laughs) Right? All of us, yeah. (laughs) All right, so uh, I guess here we go then. Here we go. Beats the living fuck out of Tony. Or out of Cody. Tony. Cody. Beats the living fuck out of him.
o'clock. And three o'clock high is, I can't recommend that enough. That's a fucking amazing movie. I'll have to try and see if I can claim that on Bite Size Cinema before somebody else covers it. <laughs> see if I can talk RJ and McCready into talking that movie with me. A uh, <laughs> bunch of other stuff. Why don't stuff. we do that movie? Well, we totally could, yeah. But yeah. it's more fun to talk about 80s movies with RJ than you. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Uh, he had basically one of those background supporting actor type roles in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Do you remember those thugs that Indy takes on whenever he's River Phoenix as a kid? Yes. And um, he was one of those thugs in uh, oh, Last okay. Crusade. I got you. Yeah. I, th- I think he was wearing like one of those um, one of those like golfer type uh, Scottish hats where they like sew the the fabric down to the brim so it makes this like flat line. I forget what they call them for the types of hats. My wife likes them and she <laughs> makes me wear them because she likes how they look on me. But uh, <laughs> he was wearing one of those backwards, and then he had like his red curly hair sticking out of the sides. But it's the same actor. He's been in a ton of other stuff. You are trying to kidnap what I've rightfully stolen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. That whole conversation's great. All right. And I have lost my place. <laughs> that is awesome because you started talking about the Princess Bride. And fuck. <laughs> it is what it is. It is what it is. For the longest time, I was convinced that the girl who grabs the basketball and slams it against the wall and starts screaming and all that, I thought that was another Nightmare on Elm Street alumni. I thought she was the female lead with blonde hair from Freddy's Dead, but it's not the same actress. Oh, okay. But I was convinced it was when I was a kid. (laughs) Because we already had an Elm Street alum, and, you know, ever since just the 10 of us, I was convinced that if one Elm Street alum is in your show, you have to put in at least two others. Uh, Yeah, I mean, that's maybe not such a bad think we should probably write a letter a strongly worded letter a, a, a strongly worded letter to so, have a movie from the 90s correct that mistake yes god damn it court if you don't stand for anything you'll fall for everything <laughs> i think the time has passed on making that happen all right fine but fuck it yeah just like i trust a vampire for a blowjob i'm like that's uh that's good that's that's a good one that's gotta a good say, one vampires give the best head though what the, the, the teeth thing careful yeah but you know there's ways around worrying about the teeth and you know vampires suck really good ah uh, well there you go right i mean um, it still looks great don't get me wrong what i'm really doing here is nitpicking because i've done nothing but suck this movie off since we started covering it so i needed to bring that in well yeah maybe ease up on sucking its metaphorical dick for a little bit <laughs> No, I was actually planting its actual movie cock. The actual, the actual real cock of the movie? Yeah, the actual real factual cock of movie. The factual? It's actual. <laughs> Let's just stop being silly and move on. We're coming close yeah. to getting this finished. <laughs> uh, I'm a little punch drunk. Hold on. Uh, okay. They're trying to seize the means of production in the Rhythm Nation. Kick the fuck out of the capitalist pig dogs and this weekend make it your bitch. <laughs> right, we gotta end it. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Woo! Alright, and I have also stopped recording.